Great. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the final session of the Purposeful Communications Seminar. Uh, my name is Zoe Fillingham from Browning Environmental Communications, and we have spoiled you with a jam-packed agenda today. Uh, there's lots to get through. Um, we're going to be giving a quick introduction um, uh, from our friends at CAF. We're then going to be running around the world with Nina Gooley, um, who will be answering the question why we aren't talking more about water. I will then sit down with Giulio Boccoletti, um, where we're going to have an excellent conversation about the hard truths uh, from a real seasoned water communicator himself. Um, we then uh, have an excellent panel, real star-studded lineup of awesome communicators on the front lines of water communications, um, which will be moderated by myself. We'll then have a short case study presentation from Georgia Badil, who's kindly uh, tuning in from Burkina Faso. And uh, then we'll wrap it up uh, with a panel led by my colleague Fabiana from CAF, who will uh, talk about all the technicalities around water and the communicators there. So um, I'd like to welcome up Angel Cardenas from CAF, uh, who will start with a few opening words. Thanks, Angel. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to stick to my promise to be very brief. I know it's really hard after lunch, so you hopefully I won't put you to sleep. Um, so I think there are two major ideas that I want to share with you. The first one is, I mean, how important is water uh, in terms of communication, why it's needed to have an effective communication. And again, we've been talking about it's the multidimensional nature of the sector. I mean, this sector touches in every single stakeholder. And to have a clear, concise, and effective communication is key in order to pass the messages. And this, and this is the second message I want to share with you, it's even more important if we see that, I mean, this is a sector that every day struggles with new challenges. Climate change is one of them. I mean, this is leading to, uh, climate change is leading to discussions about water stress and how water utility companies or all the stakeholders in the sector engage in these communications, it's key. Because otherwise, I mean, it's probably difficult that any public policy or in, um, discussion or pl um, investment planning and implementation we have, we actually correctly um, executed. So during this session, effective communication will be addressed, and we'll be talking about dealing with questions such as what is the key to effective communication with impact, how to reach public with clear messages, how to launch effective campaigns. And in addition, there will be a discussion of case studies from developing and developed countries. And hopefully, and I'm pretty sure that would happen, the panel will uh, nourish us with great experiences so we can all take home and hopefully implement them in our work. Thank you for being here, and I welcome this session. Thank you so much. Um, I'm delighted to welcome up Nina Gooley, um, who possibly has the most stamina in the entire water sector. Um, she'll be telling you about her most recent campaign as well, Source to Sea, which will be taking place, I believe, starting next year. Um, so please, a warm round of applause for Nina. Okay, um, thank you, Zoe. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and be able to have this conversation with all of you. So some of you, oh, sorry, is that how people hear me online? So I need, okay, so I don't need, I have a little bit of a habit of wandering um, and talking when I'm on stage. So stay close to the microphone for everybody watching um, online. I can see the guys at the back saying, thank goodness, she's really not that crazy. Um, just wait. Um, so m some of you know, because you were with me, um, on the 22nd of March this year, I stood on the steps of the United Nations having finished running 200 marathons in 32 different countries, the front lines of the water crisis around the world. Now, my team always says to me, Mina, you need to make sure that people understand the enormity of what you've just done. So you have to remember, like, it, this is a marathon. How many people here have run five kilometres? How many have run ten? Keep your hand up if you've run a half marathon. Wow, you guys are, like, super fit. I have a lot of confidence in this water sector. And keep your hand up if you've run a marathon. Now, imagine running four or five marathons every single week for an entire year through mud, snow, dust storms, sandstorms, and absolutely everything in between. 
The journey, as you can imagine, was not easy. And over the period of the previous 12 months as I ran those marathons, I ran with women and girls. I met women and girls across the country, these ones in Malawi, who were risking their lives every single day to go to fetch water. I handled out, handled out bottles of big plastic bottles of water to kids in South Africa who'd stayed home from school waiting for water supplies to be delivered because their towns had literally run dry. I went with the indigenous community leaders deep into the Amazon and I ran down roads like this which were so covered in mud that my shoes felt like I was wearing high heels and where the local community told me the impact that deforestation was having not only on their ecosystems but on their lives and their communities and their societies. In Uzbekistan, I ran across what used to be the fourth biggest inland ocean in the world and is now so dry it is literally desert sands and big carcasses of fishing boats like this lie marooned in those places where fishermen tell you we used to take our boats out across this sand when it was filled with water in our lifetime. Seeing these things, witnessing the death of mighty rivers like the Amu Darya broke my heart. It's completely and utterly devastating. Why, despite the signs, we're still failing to act? Climbing high up into the mountains in Tajikistan, into the Pamir, I saw firsthand the impacts of climate change, the acceleration that it's having on our water supply. I saw roads washed away, washed away by floodwaters that are coming earlier and more destructively. The message is clear. We need action and we need it now. One of the local guides said to me when we were climbing up into the Pamir Mountains. I had my helmet on, my crampons, ropes everywhere. I've got to tell you, I'm afraid of heights, so it was not the most um, exciting, comfortable moment. And it got more uncomfortable because what he said to me is, Mina, when you go out there and you speak to these people, when you talk to the media, tell them directly. The time for soft language is over. We need real action and we need it now. He's right and he's not alone. The more I ran, the more the community of people just like him stepped up to share their stories. Kids like these. People from across entire towns that turned out to welcome us. Not because of anything else, except that they wanted to rally around a symbol and they wanted to rally around a topic of water. They came out to sign the flag. They joined us online, virtually and in real life, we started to build this incredible momentum, thousands and thousands of people right across the world. And as we started to get more people, we also started to generate more influence, heads of state and leaders and royalty like the ones pictured here, and celebrities, people like Iliad Kipchoge, the greatest marathoner of all time, who turned out to say, Mina, I run through these forests, I see the impact of the water crisis, and I see the impact that water has on our forests and our, and our environment and our biodiversity. Count me in to help, because when the forests are green, the water is blue. And people like Pep Guardiola, one of the most famous football managers in the world, who made a personal message of support as we were getting close to the end to say, Mina, you've got this. And you know what? We and our team are behind you. And by the time we finished running, what had started as me running a crazy woman in the middle of a desert somewhere on the other side of the world had become literally a global movement. Thousands and thousands of people across the world. We had built the biggest global grassroots movement on water in history. Water is not just about any one of us. Water is about all of us. And that made me start to think, what was it about our campaign that helped us to go from nobodies to somebodies? What was it that we were doing that helped to convince the media to cover us? Because we were really nobodies. 
We were people that stood up and said, we believe that anybody can be somebody. And on this issue of water, we all need to be somebodies. So what do we need to do to lift up the voices of the people, get it into the media and use the media as a distribution platform? What are the lessons that we can learn from what we've done to say, why aren't we talking about more about water? And I think that there are basically three things. The first one is we called the crisis for what it was. It's horrible. It's absolutely massive. It's completely intimidating. And it's going to require us to step up in a way we've never stepped up before. It's going to require a moonshot. It's going to require us to think differently, big, bold, crazy, audacious goals, running 200 marathons, or solving the global water crisis. So this resonated with the media because we are now at a point in our time where we do have to stand up, where we do have to create these big, bold and audacious goals, and we do have to rally behind them. But rallying behind them is not something we can do alone. So the second thing we did is we created a campaign with a place for everybody everywhere. And we gave everybody a role to play. We asked leaders to lead. We asked the media to tell these stories, not my story, not the story about running, the story of the people on the ground. We took the pictures and the images and we provided it to the media. We used the run as a hook and we said, how can we find a way to lift up these voices of the people on the front lines and connect them to the leaders making the decisions? And one of the Indigenous community leaders said to me, Mina, decisions would be different if leaders could understand that things are different on the land. And it's absolutely right. So through the campaign, we made a huge effort to close that gap of knowledge by telling stories, real people in real places, in real life. And the third thing, and one of the probably the most important things, that was a story and a message that resonated everywhere, was we can do hard things. And this is incredibly important because in a, the case of a water crisis, the water crisis that is so big and is going to require so much sacrifice and require us to do things that are completely uncomfortable, we need to remember and we need to have a message that goes everywhere all the time. And it's not complicated. It's really, really simple. We can do hard things. And we can particularly do those hard things when we work and mobilise together. And when we do those hard things, we come back bigger, better and stronger. The last 18 months has been a pretty crazy journey. Um, I have been heartbroken more times than I can tell you. I cried myself to sleep more times than I care to remember. I was depressed beyond anything you can imagine. At the same time as I was suffering physically, emotionally I was being battered. To see what I've seen is something no one should ever have to witness and nothing I ever want the next generation to live through. But at the same time as I saw this, I also witnessed the flip side, the inspiration of the next generation, the older generation, every generation. People recognising that we have a water problem and that when we work together, we truly can find the solutions to it. Watching the media start to respond to these messages, not just the problems and the dire conditions around the world, but watching the media start to pick up these inspirational stories, this momentum, this movement, this group of people stepping up for change, this was completely and utterly inspiring because it tells me that this is not a problem for us or, um, or this is not something the media is not interested in. The challenge for us is how do we make the stories that exist resonate more? How do we make them relevant? How do we make these stories to be the kinds of things that the media is going to take up and show to the world? Because if we can figure out how to use that distribution platform, we crack the code. Because we know when people understand this crisis, when people feel connected to it, those people will act. 
They will join together. They will step up. We know because we've seen it. We know because most of us in this space have seen it and witnessed it for ourselves, either in our companies, in our NGOs, in our organisations, in our governments, in our communities. We know when people know that there's a problem, they will act to solve it. And the solution here is to find stories that resonate, to explain that it's hard, but that's okay because we can do hard things. And to say we're not in this to do hard things together to, on our own, we're in this to do hard things together. As someone said to me deep in my campaign, individually you can make an impact, but when we work together, we truly can solve this global water crisis. We've got this, let's go do it. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Mina, thank you so much. I just urge everyone to follow Mina in her next campaigns. And uh, I'm flipping to the next slide. Great, thank you. Yes, this is how you can follow her. Um, so I welcome my next guest to the stage, Dr. Giulio Boccoletti. Um, he really is one of the world's top thinkers on water. Uh, he's been in this space for about 20 years. He's worked all over the world in countries from China to Ethiopia. And uh, I'm really delighted to sit down with him today. Some of his career highlights include uh, co-founding McKinsey's Water Practice, all sorts of exciting stories there. Um, for many years, he was the Nature Conservancy's Managing Director for Water. Um, and he's also a member of the World Economic Forum's uh, Global Agenda Council on Water. Uh, today, you are teaching at Oxford University um, at the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment. Um, he's a senior uh, advisor at Systemic, and he's also the scientific director uh, at the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change. I also would like to plug his book, which The Economist ranked as 2021's one of their top reads. Uh, so, Julio, welcome. Thank you. So, the time for soft language is over, <coughs> and uh, you've been in this space for a while. What are we doing wrong? Right. I, well, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be with all of you here, and it's incredibly difficult to follow on Mina's extraordinarily moving uh, presentation. So thank you for that, Mina. It's hard to think that we're doing anything wrong listening to you, you know. Um, well, so uh, maybe I'll answer this question with an anecdote. I, some time ago, I decided, uh, like uh, Paul here, actually, that, we, that it would be a good idea to try and uh, do a movie about water. You know, many of you probably have had this thought. It's like, well, wouldn't it be nice if we went to the cinema and saw a movie about water? Wouldn't that move people? And so uh, I convened a bunch of um, directors, uh, documentary directors, in a big meeting hall, sort of like this, but we've 400 water professionals. And I had, uh, I had Michael Redford, who's Robert Redford's son, who's done work on the Colorado. I done, had this French director called Eric Vallée. I had an English director... Um, Dave Allen, who's uh, worked at Passion Pictures, you know, accomplished mm -hmm. documentary makers. And the conversation was, how would we tell the story of water in a way that resonates with uh, people? And one of them, I won't mention who, at some point in the middle of this discussion, turned to the audience of 400 water professionals and said, but water is so boring. <laughs> you know? And, and, and that's sort of one of the kind of key challenges here is that if you think of it as a filmmaker, you know, it's kind of wet, which you can't film. It's transparent. It, yes, it moves, but everybody's seen that. And so the very thing that fascinates all of us, the reason we are all here, is that we sort of, at some point in our lives, we've taken the, the paradigmatic blue pill and suddenly we see the world <laughs> through water, you know, and you can, you can never unsee it like uh, Mina was saying. Well, it turns out the rest of the world doesn't live that way unless they live upfront and, and personal with water. And so it's really hard to make them see yeah. this. And so I think what ends up happening is that we, what's going wrong, we try to over-explain it, over-theorize it, and fill it with jargon and words that mean mm. something to us but nothing to mm. uh, the rest of the world. And th one of the key lessons I think I, I got from that experience, we did do the movie, by the way, so it's a series from PBS, which it. you can see. <laughs> it's called H2O, The Molecule That Made Us. And, uh, and it did actually relatively well, and indeed Paul did his, and, uh, and, uh, and you can see that on Netflix. Uh, brave Blue World, right? And, and, but both have captured, I think, the essence of the problem, which is mm -hmm. water is to these stories like engineering is to the movie Ford versus Ferrari, <laughs> or astronomy is to Star Wars, right? So it's there, mm -hmm. and it's obviously the context in which this is happening, but that's not what's driving the story. You know, you were all spellbound 
by mm. Mina's story because of Mina, mm. because of her heroic journey, which on which you then hang these stories mm. of water. So I think, parad paradoxically, the stories of water to be successful must be not about water. They have to be about something else. So to talk about water, we must almost take water away, take it mm. out of the conversation. How can we maybe then reframe water? What should we... Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, this is what we all have to. But I do think. I mean, it's worth it's worth pondering the fact that we've done this before, because uh, when we come to you know, I've been coming to Stockholm for um, a while, and um, I don't know if any of you have had this experience, but it's it's an odd limbo. Like you come back. I haven't come back for a couple of years, <laughs> and and just at some level, it feels like time sort of stops, right? And um, and but but in reality, part of the reason we're struggling is that at least, in telling the story of water, mm -hmm. is that at least for some countries, for a number of countries, we've been so successful mm -hmm. that we made water disappear, right? Uh, if you think about my own country, Italy, for example, the life of the average person in Italy, 1900, uh, in the landscape, uh, mostly farmers at mm -hmm. that point in 1900, was essentially indistinguishable from the life of somebody in the same place in the 1200s. It's essentially the same thing. You lived with water, you know, water would run mm -hmm. through your living room, you would it have to there. walk to get access, you know, the reality of many people in the world today. Um, but then over the course of 70 years, uh, we replumbed the planet, right? <laughs> over the course of 70 years, we went from essentially zero storage at the time the Brits built the lower Aswan Dam on the Nile, zero storage capacity, to essentially catching a fifth of everything that comes down from the sky in 1970. That's mm. a complete... We changed the hydrology of the planet into hydraulics. Now, if you ask yourself, how do we convince ourselves to do that? What mm. was the story? It wasn't about water. Uh, you read, you know, Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana. You read Jawaharlal Nehru in India. Mm. You read, you know, uh, uh, FDR's first campaign to get elected in 1931. It's about the future prosperity of the country, mm -hmm. right? The story, there is a primacy of macroeconomic results, of the future, Making of water living aspirational. Well. Yeah, and not just water. Actually, water wasn't the thing. The, what mm. is the means is the engineering mm -hmm. in the story of Ferrari, right? It's the means by which you achieve the transformation. Now, we don't longer live in a world in which hydropower dominates our power systems, right? So it's mm. a slightly different context. But I think that's the thing that's always missing here, is that mm. ultimately, this is about people's lives in the future. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, I'll say, the last thing I'll say, I, mm. I, I don't Final do brevity, question. as you can tell, Zoe. So <laughs> to, but the, climate change is an oddly leveling phenomenon mm -hmm. because, you know, in the developed world, we have these incredible infrastructure that have made water disappear, but they've all been designed on the past climate, on stationarity. And stationarity, as you all well know, is now dead. Um, and so we may all be in the same boat soon enough, right? We'll all mm. face, again, the problem of getting rid of water in our life mm. or managing it. And so we have an opportunity to reframe it, but that reframing must be about what Mina was talking about. It's the future of those kids, right? And the, that future is not about water. Mm. It's about education and wealth creation and prosperity and, mm. uh, and their environment. And thinking about this, um, just the final question to wrap up on, um, you've been in this space for a while. If you could turn back time um, and there was one thing you wish you knew about how to better communicate water. So, you know, writing this book, I, I dug deep right mm -hmm. in the past, uh, and uh, I encountered the following story. Now, I should premise this by saying I was a scientist at one point, and so I would write papers that, you know, were very technical and had a shelf life of maybe 15 years, right? I mean, if I was lucky, somebody 15 years later would still be reading something I wrote. This book, you know, hopefully you all, you all will enjoy reading it, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, realistically, I can't imagine in 50 years' time somebody will be still, you know, mentioning a read. There'll be other books that come out. So I encountered the following story mm -hmm. as I was doing my research. Uh, there's a place uh, in California, in uh, California called Crater Lake. It's uh, in the territory of the uh, Klamath tribe. Klamath is a river that goes from Oregon to California. And the Klamath uh, have a story of how the lake was formed. Mm -hmm. uh, and they tell the story of a tribe that had this uh, chieftain who had a wonderfully beautiful daughter. And the god of the underworld emerged from the mountain, <laughs> rip, broke through the top of the mountain uh, in order to woo this, uh, this uh, daughter of the chieftain. And so the tribe invoked the help of the god of the heavens. And the god of the heavens came down to battle the god of the mm -hmm. underworld. And the, you know, the, they describe, the story describes how the, the skies darkened and filled with fire. And then eventually the god of the heavens pushed the god of the underworld back 
underground and collapsed the mountain on him and rained down. The cataracts of heaven broke Some and high the drama water here. came down <laughs> and filled and the lake. And that's how you know, this uh, thing formed. Now, it turns out we know when Crater Lake formed. Mm. It formed 7,000 years ago. It was a volcanic eruption, right? The fires filled the sky and smoke. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and we know from uh, uh, archaeological record that the Klamath tribe was in fact settled around Crater Lake 7,000 years ago. And so it turns out that this story that wasn't written by anybody in particular, wasn't written in a book, wasn't written in a paper, mm. has survived 7,000 years through all tradition and reached us, right? And so what did I, what I, you know, I came to this thing first, you know, 20 years ago almost. Uh, what did I, what do I wish I knew then? Mm. I came with an armful of facts and uh, maybe if I had an, you know, a basket of stories, of compelling stories, I would have achieved a uh, greater impact. So Fantastic. storytelling is the fundamental mm -hmm. tool because it's the tool by which we describe our past and imagine our future. And that's where water fits in. Fantastic. I think that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much. Yeah, pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you. Julia. Lots to unpack there. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome up our next panel. So please come. If you won't mind bringing a chair as well. So we have Christine Luby from Sanitation and Water for All, Adam Wentworth, who will be joining us uh, virtually from CDP, Carolina Garcia from AB InBev, and Paul Callahan from Blue Tech Research and the Brave Blue World Foundation. Wonderful, thank you all. Christine, let's yes. start with you. So Christine leads on media relations, sanitation and water for all, which is hosted by UNICEF, as you may know. Uh, we've had the absolute pleasure of working with sanitation and water for all at Browning. And um, we know that sanitation and water for all, they mobilize over 370 partners worldwide. So at Browning, we always say uh, communications, it starts with audience, of course. In water, there are many, many audiences. Uh, Christine, can you just tell us a bit about who your most important audience is? Yep, definitely. Um, so there's two audiences I'm gonna be talking about today, and that is government leaders, which are really important to us in terms of political prioritization at Sanitation and Water for All. And then the media, which is particularly important to me because I am first and foremost a journalist. Um, so those are my personal people. Um, but I want to just say, too, that I think a lot of the points that I'm going to say uh, will really sort of affirm what's already been heard in the room today. And I think that's really nice when you come to a session and you see all the speakers kind of telling you the same tips and tricks. You know that they're pretty reliable, hopefully. Um, so we did about a year ago with, um, with Browning Environmental Communications and our friends at IRC WASH and the Gates Foundation um, a survey. And if you go online to Sanitation Water for All and look up audience research survey, you should be able to find that. Um, but we looked at 200 professionals. Am I doing okay? Good, okay. Thanks, Martin. <laughs> um, thank you. We looked at um, 200 professionals, including quite a few policymakers um, at various levels of government. And um, we went across uh, different non-WASH sectors because, again, we're really trying to get out of the WASH bubble. Um, and so we looked at economic development, health, education, humanitarian response, human rights, and climate change. And we asked all of these people, these policymakers, we said, what would make you care about WASH? What, what's keeping you from prioritizing these issues? Um, and we came up with a few things, and I'll just share a couple things today. Again, go find that audience research survey at Sanitation and Water for All because there's a lot more in there. Um, but first, we learned that we need really clear financial arguments um, because there's a perception, and I think we've seen this across the sector, um, that improving wash, improving infrastructure costs too much, um, and that there's other competing priorities. And so our messaging really has to show that investing in WASH lowers the cost to public health uh, from the disease burden, um, the positive impacts that it has on economic growth and gender equality. Um, and our survey participants said specifically that they really want to know for every dollar they spend how much they're saving in other areas. So when we're going into the, each country, we really need to have that you know, cost-benefit analysis that we're looking at. Um, and then we look at, two policymakers have a lot of goals, right? Climate change, economic growth, health, as I just said. Um, and so understanding how WASH can be framed in those terms and speak to the other priorities that they're looking at, and we can show the links between them um, so that they see that delivering on WASH really delivers on their other goals as well. 
And then we looked at, too, that messages really need to communicate what the long-term political gains of WASH investment can be, um, how this can be a historical achievement or a legacy for political leaders. Um, we looked at aligning WASH to political life cycles specifically, so using three to five year time frames for planning WASH communications, um, and looking at the, where you are in the political cycle will help you determine the shape of WASH communications if it's going to be effective. So we've looked at, and I'll share some concrete examples later, but around elections, you know, kind of looking for those quick wins versus if somebody's already in office, looking at more long-term strategy and how we can engage them around that. And then, you yes. Media, exactly, yep. So I just want to close with media then. Um, I come from the gender space. I'm fairly new in the WASH sector, so maybe this is happening somewhere else. But when I speak with our partners, when I'm listening here in these sessions, I feel like I've heard, and this is the first time Mina raised this, I think this was so wonderful, but I've heard a lot of people saying that no one is talking about WASH. And to me, that's, that's, that's false. If <laughs> Go home and open your newspaper. I think at any region of the world that you're in, and there's so many water stories related to climate conflicts in Ukraine, wash infrastructure under fire, um, cholera outbreaks, you know, you name it, all major wash issues. Um, but we're not in those spaces. We're not engaging with reporters proactively. Um, we're not finding the networks of journalists who are looking for sources. Um, and again, I'll share some ways that we can do that later on. Um, but we have to get out of our, our bubble and our sort of event space that we're in regularly and start finding those journalists, asking them, how can we help you? How can we support your reporting? What can we do? And then that's how we get the story out there. Fantastic. And we also know that, of course, the private sector is really integral to that story, too. And we're delighted to be joined by Adam Wentworth from CDP. For those who don't know, uh, CDP is a global nonprofit. It's really focused on measuring and disclosing the environmental footprints of businesses. And Adam works with those businesses on their water footprint. So pleased to be joined by Adam. Uh, Adam, uh, businesses are obviously a really key audience for you. But who are you targeting within those businesses? And what sort of messages are you using? Hi. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as you said, so CDP is a global nonprofit. And so for 20 years, we've been engaging with, with the world's sort of largest companies, um, all the way from the smallest to the largest, to kind of cajole, encourage, and incentivize them to report on their environmental impacts. Um, and on water security, that work has been going since around 2010. Um, and so businesses across the, the economy um, are asked to, to, to complete what is a very thorough questionnaire into their practices. So, so we ask questions such as, you know, what are they doing about water pollution? Do they operate in, in areas where there is water stress? Are they aware of the risks, the impacts, the opportunities their businesses are having in different parts uh, of the world? And, um, and, you know, and what are they doing about it? So it provides a kind of complete look at how companies, very small, very large companies, um, we don't discriminate, are valuing water from, from the boardroom downwards. So, and one of the reasons I think we've been successful in engaging with, with this audience um, is, is not only that we use the power of, of capital markets, so we ask their investors to request that they disclose to us, but also the knowledge that, that CDP is using the data for good. Companies, uh, as the adage goes, that you know they measure their environmental risk, but are able to manage it. And so, disclosing this data provides the right people with with access to a very important source of of data, um, providing the evidence that they need to to drive action. So, um, as part of this process, CDP scores the performance of companies. Um, we have an A list that names the world's businesses um, that are leading uh, on water. So in short, we're, we're kind of calling in companies rather than calling them out, which is not to say that we aren't critical because we frequently are, um, but it comes from a position of trying to understand what it takes to, to turn the ship around within some of these, some of these organizations. So, so, as I, so as I said, we validate the strongest performance, the, the strongest performers with, with A grades. Um, and we, we provide the market their peers and their competitors with that sort of power of the example, which I think is really important. But we also provide, we offer recommendations and guidance and we use this data, which, and it does sort of boil down to how we use the information that we are given sort of voluntarily. We use the, the data-driven insights to show what companies need to be doing to value water appropriately, because often this, this basic level of information is lacking. Every company 
is at a different stage, they're at a different level on their journey into valuing water. So there is an element of needing to speak to them with empathy. It's the kind of the now what after we've explained to them uh, why this matters. So that's that's what I would say. Thanks. Um, we've got an example right here. So Carolina is uh, the Global Sustainability and Innovation Director at AB InBev. Um, this is, of course, the world's leading brewer um, and is very actively running projects all around the world. So Carolina, um, is there anything in what Adam was saying there that you'd like to pick up on? Um, moving with MC, the power of example, do those resonate with you? Yes, of course, and being the leading brewer, of course, for us, water is the most important ingredient. Without water, there is no beer. But to answer the questions, <laughs> given that we're in a communication event, I would love to answer with a story. Yes. And one of our main stakeholders for communications are communities, mm -hmm. of course, when building our projects. So I'm gonna tell you a very dear, a story that is very dear to me, but I will start with three important pillars. One will be dream big. The second one, involve others and build trust. And the third one, being build something that is sustainable for the long run. And the story is about a project that we did in Mexico some years ago called Aguas Firmes. When I was leading our water strategy for Mexico, we had a very, very daunting challenge of actually building projects that could create a measurable improved impact in our high stress watersheds because that's our public commitment. And of course, you know, water is hyper local. Mexico is a really high water stress country. And I remember one of our top leaders saying, Caro, dream big, bring something that really moves the needle and um, that is way beyond a, a more philanthropic initiative that truly moves the needle. And of course, in order to do so, to do so, you need to understand the problem. You need to involve others from academia to communities, to NGOs, to startups. And we had many partners, but that takes time, of course. But that is very important to build trust. And in those places in Mexico, specifically Zacatecas and Apan, where we have two of our largest breweries in the world, um, it took us a lot of time to understand what was that true need to solve the water problems that we were facing there. For example, in a region where agriculture is not necessarily barley production, that it's in our value chain, mm -hmm. but that it took us out of the comfort zone to start working with farmers that were producing other things, to listen to them and understand what they truly needed. And of course, once we had built this project that took us many months, many brilliant minds eh, involved, eh, writing down, eh, even doing workshops for the community to define how they wanted to name the project, to actually own it and be proud of it. And then it came to the, the third pillar and how we build something that is truly sustainable. And that's when we decided to apply to a grant for the German cooperation, a three million euros grant, uh, that we were successful and we won it. And then of course we had to tell the company, you need to match this, right? Mm -hmm. They're not going to give us the funds <laughs> without a matching on the table. And we had to match it with another five. And that's how we build that sustainability, the financial sustainability to actually deliver uh, on these projects for the mm -hmm. first couple of years. And I'm super happy uh, to hear from my colleagues that we're now going into the next iteration uh, of the projects with new partners. Great, fantastic. And finally, Paul, Paul O'Callaghan, he's the CEO of Blue, uh, of water intelligence firm, uh, Blue Tech Research, and uh, also the lead at Brave Blue World Foundation. Um, which created the hit documentary, if you haven't yet seen it, uh, with Matt Damon. And of course, thinking about that film, Paul, um, and the work that you had to do with the public to really engage them on that, is it that we always need a celebrity to help engage the public, or does it just help? Well, we had a scriptwriter, and I remember at one point he said to us, you know, your audience is people who are mildly interested but easily distracted. <laughs> <laughs> and I never forgot that, and I thought, yeah, he's probably correct, actually. So celebrity helps to get attention to begin mm -hmm. with, but it's not what brings them in. What brings them in is the human story, really, like Mina's story. Um, and Julio, you're right about the mythology. We'll never forget those stories. We've come across an incredible amount of them in the new film project we're working on um, from all over the world, and they're really captivating. So yes, a celebrity helps to mm. just draw them mildly interested <laughs> in, but it really it's the human stories that maintain them. And, um, 
I will say we're delighted to be able to partner with ABN Bev and telling one of those stories in the next film. Um, one of the amazing projects that you've been pioneering and supporting is in Peru, where people are rediscovering a wisdom that has been around for a thousand years and is so relevant today to restore these ancient pre-Inca canals, the Amunas, and through your local beer brand, Cusquini, as a partner, um, you've been restoring those. We were fortunate to be there filming during a water festival, and <laughs> that was magical because you had people celebrating water, singing songs about water, doing water blessings. Mm. Um, and really, it was the joy. It was the joy that they experienced. And I think that's the one piece we hope to capture mm. in the next film is that very human that we all have, you know? Mm. We all have it. We talk here in our professional language, but when we go home, we all relate to water in very other different ways. And I think every human being does. Fantastic. Great. Well, um, at Branning, we always know that communications has a business impact. Um, and really, we list these as three key things. So it's increasing awareness, it's engaging audiences, a bit like as we've discussed already, um, but it's also building trust as well. And that's a really key one too. Um, Paul, I'm going to stay with you. Uh, thinking about this film and some of the actual impact it's had in the world, um, and especially around raising awareness, do you think you could give me some examples or flavor of how we knew you'd really had raised awareness about the water crisis? Well, th the motivation for the film was, I, I travel a lot with work, and you know, you come in from the airport, you hop into an Uber, a, a cab, and you strike up a conversation, and why mm. are you here? I'm here for a water conference. <laughs> and you know, you can kind of gauge, if you're in Singapore, they start telling me about new water and reverse osmosis. If I'm in Israel, they'll have a very in-depth conversation. And I noticed that the Netherlands, Israel, Singapore, that level of awareness was so much to the forefront. And those are countries that really lead the way mm. when it comes to solving water challenges. And I thought, how could you get to the point where th you know, a person you might meet there uh, you know, in, in on your way in from the airport, you know, or I, I won't call them an ordinary person, but a, a citizen, would um, have that level of awareness. And that was the motivation mm. to, because that starts there. Because we have great technologies, mm. there's finance wants to bring to bear, we need policy, policy starts with people. And that was that motivation for why can't we get people excited and engaged with mm. what's possible and get them thinking about that mm. as opposed to always talking about mm. the challenges. And, and you and I have spoken as well about some of the kind of unconventional outcomes of the film as well, perhaps in the video game, um, which, you know, if we can gamify the solutions, um, perhaps that's a new interesting tool for communications. Maybe you could just tell us a bit about that. Yeah, it's winning hearts and minds. And you know, you don't have to win all the hearts and minds. We, we know from social science, if you get 15 or 20% of a social mm. group to move in a direction, you, you reach that point. Um, yeah, like one of the inspiring things we saw was a video gamer down in Uruguay saw the film, was inspired to create a video game that's now been launched and will reach a whole new generation of people through a new medium, and he's Thank gamified you. the water crisis. It's called Water 2050. And in that game, you get to go back in time and take decisions today, and then you go back to 2050 <laughs> and see what worked and what didn't work, and it's a really lovely way of engaging people. So we love to, those are the types of impacts we're seeing every week. We still get schools contacting us. Um, anecdotally, I was staying with cousins of mine in Tennessee. They didn't know that much about me. We don't meet up that often. And one of my cousins said, I saw your film, my teacher showed it to me in high school. <laughs> and I went, oh, that's really cool. You know, so it's cool. lovely when you get those things coming back. Um, yeah, so bit, bit by bit. And um, we're, we're look excited about the journey we're on with WWF now with the next project too. Great, Thanks. thank you so much. Adam, I'll turn to you. Um, CDP has done an incredible job on engaging corporates around the world on climate action. And um, I would love for you to just tell us a bit more about one of the most successful campaigns you've done on water specifically, and whether you think it's delivered trust or helped in increase engagement, um, or just generally raised awareness around uh, around water. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I always find impact, that sort of idea of impact, can be quite hard to judge when it's not sort of staring sort of right, right at you in the face. Um, and a lot of the work we do in the first instance is, is raising awareness, you're getting companies to disclose it's the sort of just the first step in a journey to hopefully becoming a sort of leader on, on water security. So, um, I mean, if you look at the whole the whole market, there are examples of some companies which are doing a lot on water. Um, but what we need is everyone to, to be on board. And um, and as mentioned, there are there are many companies which are just starting out on this journey. So I think the water security program, which in itself is a kind of campaign, a yearly campaign, which started over a decade ago, and we had about 176 companies. Uh, report to CDP at that at that time, and so 
in 2022, that figures about 4,000 companies with, with many well-known names, you know, things, um, Louis Vuitton, L'Oreal, Mars, for example, they'll provide this information, they devote resources um, to, to, to give it to us voluntarily. So, and it's not just that, that one sector, it's the whole breadth of the economy, the global economy, which is represented in those, those 4,000 businesses. So I think that in itself is a testament to, to a kind of year in, year out program of engagement. Uh, reporting on the progress that companies have made using uh, using the unique data that we are given each year. So it's the, so it's really the sort of consistency of the messaging each year. The kind of the, the disclosure cycle is going to happen uh, each year, and the, the drumbeat of the need to disclose ha has raised awareness. Um, and because what we everything that we do is kind of revolves around data, the kind of two the two data points that I wanted to highlight was. Um, that kind of evidences how this sort of year in year out campaign has been successful, um, and that data can uh, shows that disclosure at least actions. So we've have around twenty eight percent of companies that disclose to CDP for the first time on water will assess the the business growth implications of water security, and by the third year, after they've gone through the process a couple of times, it rises to around around forty percent. And similarly, when I mentioned the sort of water A list that we, we publish each year, there are now 107 companies on that list. And there are around 31 companies about five years ago. And again, these are including companies such as Coca-Cola, Ford, and Nissan. So, so it's, it's, those provide a couple of indications, I think, that, that calling in companies with a con consistent drumbeat of a campaign can have a, the desired impact. Thanks. Thanks for that, Adam. Um, again, turning to Carolina, as one of those companies, I think, uh, and as we've mentioned, trust being so critical, do you think you could tell us a bit about how um, AB InBev is really helping uh, build trust with the communities around uh, the water projects that you run? Um, and maybe just tell us a bit more about how you do that in your communications. Thank you, Zoe. And the previous example was about communities. Perhaps we switch to a key stakeholder, which are consumers and Paul and thank you for the partnership just mentioned an amazing example which is Amunas and the power of our brands like Cusqueña but perhaps then I'll tell you another story of a project that it's closer to home I'm from Colombia um, and in Colombia we have also Bavaria our business unit um, and we have an amazing ecosystem there that provides water to 70 percent of Colombians which are the Paramos and they are hard to describe, but imagine a high Andean wetland mm -hmm. uh, with lagoons, with also a special tree called Frailejon that captures mist from the air and they're just magical and wonderful mm -hmm. and I love them. Mm -hmm. And we had a project to protect one of these paramos uh, in Colombia and it was a great project. We had been doing it with the Nature Conservancy, with the Water Fund, with other stakeholders, and it was great. But how do you scale it? And I'm going to talk here mm. about the power of the brands. And again, with like three messages that for me are important. Be creative, the perfect is the enemy of the good, and transparency. Mm -hmm. So for, for us, of course, this project was being financed at the beginning by the foundation, but budget is limited. Nature-based solutions require also big budgets sometimes. Mm -hmm. So we thought, how do we create a financial mechanism for the long run? And we thought, okay, maybe we can launch a brand that actually finances this project for the long run. And at that moment in time, we were lucky because the company was looking to diversify its portfolio and they were going to launch a water brand. And we thought, why don't we launch a water brand that has a purpose within its DNA and it's not just a regular water brand. Mm. And we said, yes, but of course that could have a backlash, right? Because a water brand sponsoring a water project, we had very hard conversations. How do we do it? And that's when I say the perfect is the enemy of the good. So. We made sure that if we were going to launch a water brand for a sustainability initiative, it had to be made fully and 100% of recycled content, of recycled PET mm -hmm. before it went into market, that the water source that um, it was using wasn't the water so source of the watershed that we were trying to protect, but just the, the regular water that we use for our beer production at another location. And we had these hard conversations and decided that this could be a really good financial mechanism for the water project in the long run, and we launched it. And it's a beautiful brand called Salva, with a Z, which means save, and it's a water that it's in, in its core, it wants to save the Paramos. 
but also going back to the traceability, building trust with consumers, because at the end of the day, the consumers are the ones that are going to pay for this project. So how do we build this trust? So amongst many things, we created um, a committee out of a very well-known environmentalist in the country that were respected uh, by many, and we were reporting to them on a quarterly basis about everything that we did, how we spent every cent, and publicly also, we, we also um, disclosed how many uh, bottles had we sold and how much we had invested in the project. Uh, and this project is still going on. It has been since, since 2018, and now the water brand is in a position to go to a second Paramo. So now it's not only working in one, but in two Paramos, and that's how uh, you create this financial uh, mechanism mm. for the long run. So really using communications to kind of bridge that divide between projects that are quite far away and remote for a lot of your consumers and making them real. Great, fantastic. Thank you. Christine, lastly for you to wrap up. Um, obviously the dream is that kind of all stakeholders will get behind mm -hmm. sanitation and water for all and there's some amazing work that you've done already to really engage stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, how have you used communications to mobilize so many of them? And I'm thinking especially about government ministers as well. Yeah. Um, when they have so many competing interests, how do you make it real? Yeah, so um, there's two quick examples I wanna share from the government side and one from the, the media side. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, as, as Zoe mentioned, we have 370 partners. Um, among them are civil society uh, organizations. When we gave them this audience research survey, um, one of the things they did was start really looking at election advocacy. So um, an example we just had in Sierra Leone around the elections, one of our civil society partners, uh, WashNet, um, went and just started knocking on the door of every single politician that was running for office, didn't matter what party they were from or if they aligned with water and sanitation goals. Um, and they had really specific asks from those politicians in this civil society declaration and they got 258 political candidates across all parties to sign this commitment uh, to prioritize water and sanitation. Now that's just a start once those people get into office, now we need them to implement that, but that does give a focal point and a door to go knock on to say, hey, remember us, you signed this pledge, now we want you to deliver on it. Um, so that was really great. And one thing that they, they raised, which I thought was so, um, so interesting and so helpful, was that they said that there were a lot of political leaders that they thought, this person will never help us, this is probably a waste of time. And those were some of the best and most effective conversations that they had. So they said, don't assume when you go to a political leader's office that you know what their standpoint is on WASH. Um, give them the chance to have a discussion and again, Go back to some of these things, ask them why are you not prioritizing WASH, you know, is it because you have other competing priorities, how do we help with those? Um, the second thing I want to highlight from governments is that Sanitation and Water for All is working with um, UNICEF, IRC WASH, and the government at the Netherlands, and we're welcoming new partners into this as well. So if this interests you, please come find us. Um, but we've been launching um, head of state initiatives, so presidential compacts, for example, on water and sanitation, because we also believe that if we want to further water and sanitation, it has to start from the top, not just you know from the, the local levels of government. Um, and so uh, two days ago, we launched two new compacts uh, in Malawi, in South Sudan, we now have 10 in total um, that they're working on. And part of the reason that Malawi, for example, was really interested in this was because our compacts on water and sanitation are not water and sanitation alone. They're working on, again, climate resiliency after Cyclone Freddy. Um, they're working on solving the public health crisis with cholera. So again, we're really working on WASH to connect to all of their, mm -hmm. their other priorities um, to help with that prioritization. And that's been so helpful across all of those compacts. Um, and then finally, when it comes to journalists, I went to the International Journalism Festival in Perugia, Italy earlier this year. It's one of the largest gatherings of journalists from all over the world. Um, and I sat and talked with a lot of journalists about why, you know, what's, what's kind of the difficulties with the water sector? What's, what's you know, what's the, the catch for them? Mm -hmm. And they said that so often people come to them, and this is across the development space, and they just want PR, right? We just want them to cover our press release, we just want them to cover an event, but we're not asking them what the reporting is that they're doing, how we can be helpful to them, how we can provide expertise, and that ultimately is the goal, right? It's not just about getting them to cover events, that's really great and that's one tool in the toolbox, but when they're telling these stories about you know, water insecurity and cholera outbreaks, what 
are the solutions to those? How do we start moving into solutions journalism? The way we do that is by offering experts as sources, because a lot of media outlets are saying they're having a really hard time finding sources, and start connecting them with that and really start helping them with their reporting. But the way we do that is by going into those spaces where those journalists are and really asking them what they need and listening to that and then delivering on it. Fantastic, loads of top tips there. I can see the audience is writing down notes. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, that concludes our first panel for the moment. Thank you so much to all my panelists and also Adam online. Can I join me in a <laughs> welcome? Thank you. We now turn to Georgie Padil, who's uh, joining us from Burkina Faso. She's going to be telling us about some of the communications she's doing on the ground and the projects that the Georgie Padil Foundation is running. Um, so we're pleased to have Georgie dial in. That is not Georgie. Oh no. Okay, well we'll jump ahead. I think Georgie will come back. Fantastic. Well, then roll on the next panel. Um, really pleased to introduce you to my colleague Fabiana from CAF, who will be leading us through the next conversation. Thanks, everyone. Good afternoon to all. I would like to invite my panelists. Please, Mariam, Cristina, Gonzalo. Okay. Okay, it's a pleasure uh, to moderate this interesting panel called he Hearing from Technical Experts about Cutting Through Complexity Using Communication. I'm going to interview the following panelists who are working in the thick of the water industry. So we're going to listen from them about their rela relationship with water users, uh, some examples of technical challenge um, they have faced, and about tools they used to an effective communications. So without further ado, uh, we are going to start with the panel discussion. First of all, I would like to um, introduce Gonzalo Mejengiza. Gonzalo is the manager of international affairs at AISA Argentina, which is the second water and sanitation utility of the region and the fifth worldwide in terms of number of users. Gonzalo, regarding your role in a water and sanitation utility, I would like to ask you two questions. What are the most important communication actions that your organization has carried out to proper water use from customers? And on the other hand, could you please provide uh, us some examples of communication tools your organization has used to inform and manage difficult situa situations on the service provision, such as service interruption, problems with, qu with water quality, or tariff increases? Okay, thank you very much, Fabiana, Franz, and CAF for inviting us to be part of this panel. I feel very happy to be with you today. First of all, I want to share with you which debates, which discussion we have uh, inside our board every day when we have to communicate something to our audience, <coughs> to our customer, for instance. One of the, the questions we ask uh, ourselves if, is if we are a healthcare company, if we are an uh, environmental care company, if we are a constructor, or maybe if you are an energy power provider, because we do every single thing I have mentioned before. So, it is not the same to, com to communicate water, to communicate sanitation, to communicate, uh, communicate uh, health care. We have to develop, carry out different strategy to address different audience and different uh, issues. Uh, I want to, to share with you one experience that uh, we, we had three years ago when the pandemic of COVID-19 uh, with the outbreak of the pandemic at this moment. Uh, one, three, or two water utilities among Latin America and Europe as well, trying to develop a methodology to detect the, the virus itself into the water, into the, the wastewater. 
And we did it. Uh, we, we achieved that goal, and it was very important for us because uh, we consider at this moment that we were able to contribute to the healthcare system, not only with our customer, but with the country itself and the region. Okay, but when we started communicating this, this technology, uh, we were afraid that people started thinking that they can uh, get ill uh, from the water. At this moment, nobody knew how the virus, uh, how was the, the transmission mechanism of the virus. So we discussed internally how to communicate this topic, and it was very, very hard to find uh, the way to do it. So at this moment, we decided not to communicate to the audience, but trying to teach other utilities along the region through uh, academic channels, papers, congresses, virtually, of course, at this moment. But well, the information filtered and too much people notice, be aware uh, of that, of that uh, situation and starting asking our, ourselves if they are in danger taking or drinking our water. So these kind of challenges uh, are in front of us every day, every, every single day. The other case I want to share with you is when one morning, I think one Sunday morning, people start calling us, telling that water was in green color and it tastes like an olive. They started <coughs> saying that our water was not safe. So we have to, to try to do a trial, technical professional will understand me, which is called DAFNA, the DAFNA proof, the, the, the DAFNA trial, that uh, can confirm, help us to confirm that the, the water is health, that is safe to be drink. But well, it's not easy to explain to 15 million people that green color water with olive taste and odor is safe. So it was a big challenge to overcome for us and it was related to climate change. Mm -hmm. So at this moment, we can solve it. We, can, we could take out the odor and the color from water, but we know that in the decades to come, it's going to happen again and again. So we have to develop a kind of methodology to communicate this kind of crisis, okay? Mm -hmm. One of the tools we have found to do it is uh, artificial intelligence. We have developed a chat box who can answer immediately this kind of question that can arise from our audience. This is one of the tools. The, the, the other one was to enter the media market with podcast. At this moment, we are doing a lot of podcasts trying to, to train the people uh, with issues uh, and challenges uh, regarding to, to climate change. This was the other tool that we are trying at this moment with success. And finally, I want to tell you one particular situation that we have at ITESA, ITESA huge water utility, uh, which is private. Uh, we are ruled by private legislation. We are a company but belongs to the go federal government. Uh, our main shareholder is the government. So we are a mixture. And our CEO is appointed by the president of the nation. In our case, is a well-known politician, maybe the most important feminist leader in Argentina, uh, the wife of our Ministry of Economy and the candidate for the presidency. So we have to deal with political communication every day, not only technical and water sector. And this is a big challenge for us because every day our company can be the target for politics uh, attacks. 
And on the contrary, every single thing that we do every day can be read as a political movement or action. So we have to be very focused in communicate technical things. And as you know, uh, people are not aware of water. You told me, <laughs> you told us, you as well. So it is a big challenge to try to engage people with water, uh, avoiding to be taken as a politicians giving speeches. So this is the big challenge. For, as a conclusion, I want to tell you that uh, I think, and our team as well, that in the future, water utilities are going to enter new markets, beauty, healthcare, energy, agriculture. So uh, re regarding the communication strategies, we are going to, to deal with two big challenges. The, the first one is adding a new languages, adding new vocabulary to our operation. We have to learn how to, to tell about beauty, for instance, we are going to develop a water to, to, to wash <laughs> uh, our head, or we, we have to learn how to address uh, energy or power issues as well. This is one of the big challenges. And the, the other one is, as our population is being more inequality every day, uh, we have to learn how to, to address uh, poor people and rich people at the same time. It's sad, but it's true. Uh, we have rich people that can be included into Forbes, and on the other hand, 1,000 slums, which people are under poverty and lives without any education or other. So this is, it is not easy to use the same social network, to use the same press release, uh, and have the same impact in such different population. Thank you very much again for, for the invitation. I'm very Great. happy with, to be with you. And well, I open to answer. Thank you. Answer. Thank you very much, Gonzalo, for sharing your experience. You. It's very interesting that you say about the big challenge that ISA has and the tools and, and some examples. Uh, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, the second panelist is Mary, Miriam Gray. Miriam works as an external affairs and communications lead in sustainable development group of the World Bank Group. Miriam, in your role as part of a multilateral finance organization and working in the water sector, I would like to ask you, what are the most important actions in effective communication that your organization has carried out? And let me think, let me link with, with another question. Uh, what kind of message would you like to share to the audience towards the achievement of F SDGs? Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much. Um, I want to start with two things. I will not tell you a story because it's so hard to go after Nina. So <laughs> I'll spare you from my stories. <laughs> and I can guarantee you the World Bank is not going to be entering the beauty market. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should, but this is not happening. <laughs> but in all its uh, seriousness, um, I think the issues we are accounting and seeing in the way we have to communicate across the entire sustainable development sector in the bank is not very much different from what the rest of you are dealing with every day, including what you said, Gonzalo. There are a few things which we definitely learned along the way, which I think would be very useful to sort of mention. Uh, first of all, complexity of messages should not negate the clarity of thought. And the messages mm -hmm. we communicate are extremely complex, political. Mm -hmm. It's the reality of it. It's very busy and very um, saturated space. Communicating for us is basically going through a number of very technical details and reports and mm -hmm. economic data and, you know. And the way we work is that if the technical person doesn't understand what he's trying to communicate and explain within three to five minutes, we have a problem. 
which we really need to address. What is the core message? How we can talk about the problem? Who is the audience? And believe me, the amount of time I have heard everyone is our audience is, you know, mind blowing. And <laughs> the reality is it doesn't work this way. We all know that. Um, and maybe not everyone is our audience. Maybe some reports do mean to go to a technical audience and maybe they should stay this way. Maybe we shouldn't try to TikTok every single technical report. <laughs> you know, maybe that's just what it is. And that is the question and conversation to be had mm -hmm. with a lot of our colleagues. And um, I think this is across a lot of development institutions. We should really think about who, who, whom are we talking to? Who is the audience? Mm -hmm. The second one, I think, is that a lot of times the, the technical content and, you know, um, a lot of depth of knowledge we have to deal with is comes without the thinking of what is the end in mind. So the begin with end in mind. We have this conversation in our team a lot. Encourage technical people to think outside the box. Ask, ask, box, ask the hard questions, not to be afraid to ask the hard questions. It can be a very intimidating discussion. You know, let's face it, you know, a lot of, um, you know, very big names in the, you know, in the field and whatnot, but, you know, Consistency and order, examples of how we can address the issue, right tools and technology. We've really, I think we've really innovated throughout the pandemic and remote work. We went to an immersive space, we went to a 3D, we, you know, the, the game, game, gamification of communications. I mean, as controversial as it can be, because a lot of times we deal with real people, real projects, you know, we do have an interesting application uh, working about, working on the, dam safety issues, you know, what happens when the dam collapses and how to address these issues, you know, these are all sort of leapfrogging throughout the pandemic, which we probably wouldn't have a space for if we would not be sitting at home looking at our screens. So I think that's also important and we really should take advantage of that. And, you know, basic things, defining the tools, defining the metrics, uh, crowded, how do we crowd digital ecosystem? How do we understand the motivation? What motivates people behind, uh, you know, the screen? Um, traditional outreach, uh, and I think the World Bank has this incredible advantage on con and having convening power across different platforms in the world. Our work on Swatch Bharat mm -hmm. and the behavior change communication around the Swatch Bharat can really be translated in many different uh, projects we're working in Africa, in Nigeria. That's sort of a big example I think we worked with SWA and that. So um, that is something which can really, we can lift and take to a different place. Uh, you know, and the relevance. How relevant are we? Are we talking to the people in the language they can understand? So that's yeah. sort of three things I wanted to mention. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam. Very interesting. Um, and last but not least, I would like to introduce Christina Arango. She has led multiple entities of Colombia at national and local level as well during the past three and a half years. She was the CEO of the Water and Sewer Company of Bogota. Cristina is going to share a presentation about purposeful uh, communication and, and advocacy. And let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I'm going to go with the slides. So thank you very much for letting me speak here. Um, so, so basically, I'm, I'm going to speak through the perspective of a utility company um, and how can we deliver messages because we have a very powerful tool. And what powerful tool we have we can, is that we have direct, uh, we can address people directly. Just in Colombia, the three big utility companies uh, have 15, can address 15 million people every month. That is 30% of the population. So we have a big important tool here, here that we need to start to address to deliver better the messages. And actually when you think about it, actually, sorry, the messages are actually aligned with SDGs. Uh, so that's very important because if we actually, uh, achieve these goals, these utility companies will work and operate more efficiently. So it's important that we have this tool. We, we need is to find a way to use them uh, better. So what type of problems we address, especially in cities that doesn't work as well as Stockholm? 
Uh, and, and that is most of it, um, well, waste. Uh, this is the Bogota River, if you, if you see it better. So basically, if you are in Bogota um, and you want to get some furniture, you can actually go to the Bogota River and get a sofa. Uh, and that really doesn't make any sense. So we really need a cu cultural transformation because people in the margin in these type of cities uh, were, were, are very informal, then you can actually make a difference in the margin. Uh, so it's important to deliver messages. So what, are, what type of messages we're dealing with? So first, Cultural transformation and creating awareness and also accountability, of course, telling me people, hey, you are doing it right, you are doing it wrong, but we're, we know what you are doing. So those two things, and I'm going to try to explain you three types of things that we did in an innovative way to deliver these messages. Uh, experiments, randomized experiments with the billing statements, uh, media campaigns with social influencers and public scorn or price. So the first, experiments. So we did randomized experiments with the billing statements in which we actually tell people, hey, uh, we had a congratulatory message in which uh, we told the people, hey, your you are consuming less than your neighbor. So congratulations, you are helping to preserve water. And on the other hand, we told people, hey, you have an alert. Uh, taking care of water requires your help because you are consuming more uh, than your actual neighbor. And we find out that it, they, we had a huge impact, actually, uh, because higher income households diminish their consumption significantly after having these type of messages. And the same happened for people who actually consumed a lot more, more than 24 cubic meters. So the, the message has an impact and it was super cost effectively. So we can actually use these tools to deliver messages in a very nice way. The second thing is media campaigns. So in this world where social media is here and is here to stay and is getting stronger. So uh, we actually started using social media and, and we started working with a very nice influencer of Colombia who's called Steve RG. Uh, and we went to the motel area uh, in, in, of the city uh, on some Valentine's Day, actually. Uh, <laughs> And we tell the people, hey, it, condoms cannot go to the toilet because actually if they go to the to to toilet, you will clog the system on one hand, but also they will go to the river and you're contaminating. So we have the CEO of the company talking about condoms, which is kind of risky on somewhere. But on the other, we, were, we managed to deliver an interesting message and people got to understand a little bit better. And with the influencer, we got a lot of likes and all the, all the numbers that you can imagine. So these type of new thi ways of doing things are actually getting, um, we, we can deliver the message. So we did, I'm not gonna go through it, we did other type of likewise uh, stuff, uh, but using new ways of communicating uh, is not always bad, uh, social media. So we need this just to find a way to use it better. And the final thing is public scorn or praise. Um, so water losses is a big deal in, in the world world. In, in, in Latin America, 44% of the water is lost. In, in Bogota, it's, it's 36%. So actually, uh, and not all of it is technical because we tend to think out, uh, uh, in a technical way, but uh, actually it's in, in Bogota and the cities, it's, it's commercial. Basically, people are stealing water. So if you actually go to a place in Bogota to wash your car, the probability that this place is connected directly to the network and stealing all the water, it's 80%. Uh, 
uh, which is huge. And if you're still in water, basically you are not using it well, but, but it really is not using efficiently. So what we did, uh, and we communicate with this, these people and tell them, hey, we know what you're doing, please start to doing it better uh, and, and communicate and tell them that, hey, we're watching, we're seeing you, and please, we need it. Uh, you cannot steal water from the system. Uh, and what ha finally happened is that we managed to diminish uh, the water losses in four million cu cubic meters in the city in two years. So this was obviously not the only strategy, but it was a huge part of it. Um, so communicating this type of things, uh, it's also really, really important. On the other hand, acknowledge people and praising them is also very important because in these informal environments, uh, then we have some people who actually do it very well uh, and not the usual suspects. So, so telling people, hey, you can do it well, let's show you what you're doing, makes also a difference. So those were the, the, the big uh, examples that I wanted to, to tell you, but basically I wanted to finish with three main ideas. First, obviously, communication is a powerful tool to, for cultural transformation. We, I believe utilities can do a better job communicating and they have a powerful tool that is that they can actually reach a lot of people and households. And finally, infrastructure, it's important. We need it, but if it's not getting here as fast as we need it, we need cultural change. Uh, in the meantime. So we need to address these problems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Christina. It's really uh, amazing the tools and messages that you have been built, really, by the public company. Uh, after uh, these three exciting interventions, I would like to thank the panelists uh, for their valuable contribution and thank you all for your attentions. I, give, I would like to give the floor to Sue to a closing remarks, please, and thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. So, lots to unpack there. Um, Mina told us that the era of soft language is over, um, but importantly, that we can do it. Julio told us that we actually need to stop talking about water, or at least talk about water less. Uh, and he wishes he had fewer facts and more stories when starting out. Um, lots of insights from our panelists as well. Uh, we heard about uh, the creative uses of branding from AB InBev. Uh, we learned about how you know, the star power of celebrity can be very helpful. Video games can be very helpful. Some unusual topics there. Um, also adding new language, that's helpful too. Miriam is telling us that uh, we should, well, we should, we don't need to TikTok every report and there is still, you know, a place for technical knowledge as well. Um, and Christina highlighted, of course, that condoms can have amazing cut through, which is great, but also critically that cultural change is important and is possible and communications can help do that. So thank you to everyone. Thank you for our excellent lineup and thank you for being here in the room. It's so good to see so many of you um, and for all those joining online. Thank you very much. <laughs>